Greg Nibbler with Fox 12 Oregon, sitting down right now with Congresswoman Suzanne Bonamici. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Really, really appreciate it. And, uh, Thank you. You know, so many different things that we want to get to and talk about. And I think, you know, to start off, you know, you're back here in Oregon, right? Um, which is great. Great to see you here and, you know, checking out your district and talking to people. But I wanted to discuss one thing that you really just kind of put forward that's been getting a lot of, uh, a lot of coverage. Mm -hmm. And that's your Bill of Rights for students and parents. Right. And uh, maybe you can walk mm -hmm. us through, you know, what that sure. is and why it is you feel it's so important. Thank you. Well, thank you for the invitation, and it's great to be here. Well, I serve on the Education Committee, which is my passion. Uh, and when I heard that the Education Committee was considering parental involvement, I thought, great, sign me up. It's something I did for years. My kids went through public schools right here in the Beaverton School District. Uh, and I know how important it is for parents to be involved. And then I took a look at what the majority party was putting forward. And to me, and to a lot of people I spoke with, educators, parents, students, it didn't address the issue of parental rights. Instead, what the Republicans put forward was a, basically a blueprint for book banning and micromanaging and really creating more of an adversarial relationship between parents and teachers. That doesn't work for me, it doesn't work for students, it doesn't work for educators, and it's not gonna improve public education. So I worked with parent groups like the National PTA, with civil rights groups because we don't want discrimination, we, we want uh, students to be learning accurate history uh, and to be safe in school. So I worked with lots of different organizations and drafted a parent and student bill of rights that instead focuses on building constructive relationships and, and collaborative relationships between students, parents, and educators. So I'm thrilled that more than 250 organizations, both national and local, are supporting my parent and students' bill of rights. Uh, the, the version that the majority party put forward passed the House with, uh, without my support over my objection. Uh, fortunately, it won't go anywhere in the Senate, and I hope we can work together on something that's more, much more constructive and that actually does address the important role of parents in education. You mentioned that uh, that one that the, Repo the, the Republicans put forward is not going to pass through. Um, so with yours, do you have hope that this will make it through, to go through through there, or how can we find some kind of hope between those two? Uh, thank you. We're always optimistic. And yeah. with the breadth of support uh, from organizations, I mentioned the National PTA, mm -hmm. teachers groups, civil rights groups, I'm going to keep working on it. And um, I have great support from members of the Education Committee. And I hope we can do this, um, because I'm there to make good policy. You know, I'm not really interested in having a bill that just passes one chamber and doesn't pass the other and is used for messaging. That's not why I'm there. Let's really work on something that's constructive. Well, talking about that too with, you know, both parties and, and where maybe there's some compromise, you know, yeah. obviously with the school shootings and things that are going on in this country, especially recently with Tennessee and even since then more, there seemed to be kind of a push to do something in Congress about this, what that is, I guess is kind of up to interpretation. Do you sure. see anything happening, working bipartisan-wise, or anything that could pass to address that issue? Well, this is a serious concern. Uh, gun violence prevention is something that I've cared about for years. In fact, shortly after I joined Congress is when Sandy Hook happened in Connecticut, and I thought at that point, uh, after what happened in Newtown, Connecticut, that we must be able to do something and we did it until just last year. We did pass something called the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. And as part of that bipartisan legislation, which President Biden signed into law, there is some funding to help with school safety. Now, what I'd like to see done with that is evidence-based programs that really do make a difference. Um, and so there is something, I'm gonna keep working on it because I know there's more we can do. I've spoken with students, high school students especially, who say, they get into school and the first thing they do is they try to figure out where they can hide and how they can escape. That's tragic. Uh, students should not feel unsafe in schools and at the same time people shouldn't feel unsafe at places of worship or grocery stores or movie theaters and all these other places where there have been mass shootings. This is a unique problem to the United States. 
Other countries don't deal with gun violence the way we do. So I'm hopeful that we can find some common ground to get together and talk about what we can do. You know, there was a time for a decade when we had an assault weapons ban and it actually reduced these mass shootings. I think we should have that conversation again. There's no reason for weapons of war to be in the hands of especially, you know, teenagers and young people who are gonna use them for only for the purpose of killing people. We can respect the Second Amendment and keep our students and communities safer. Do you think there's any anything that's gonna move forward with that? Talking about the assault weapons ban and maybe bringing that back, is there anything being introduced that would address that? Uh, unlikely in this Congress, but we're not gonna stop working on it. There are several pr proposals. I'm on the Gun Violence Prevention Task Force. There are several proposals that might be able to get some, gun, some bipartisan support, but we did. I mean, it was a pretty big deal to pass that Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. We did that uh, with bipartisan support. I got to go to the bill signing, you know, outside at the at the White House to celebrate that. And we recognize it was a step in the right direction uh, because we all want our communities to be safe. Um, switching gears here, kind of back to, to Oregon and something that I know you did yesterday, which was meeting with uh, Under Secretary Small yes. uh, regarding rural broadband issues, right. which is a, really a big concern. It um, is. Can you tell us about that meeting, what you talked about, and what right. some of the initiatives are to address that? First of all, it was a great meeting. I have a lot of respect. So uh, Undersecretary of the USDA, uh, Sochito Small, was a colleague of mine in the, in the Congress uh, from New Mexico, uh, very dedicated now in her new role as Undersecretary undersecretary to addressing rural broadband issues. Uh, and it's interesting too, because this is the USDA and they have a role in that as do other agencies as well. And so we had a good conversation and we had a lot of different voices around the table, including a student, for example. Uh, we were at a school where we held the meeting and the student told us about how challenging it was trying to do uh, virtual learning during uh, the height of COVID. And he was so, you could just sense the frustration in his voice. He's like, I'd be trying to do a math test and everything would shut down. And then, you know, I, I fell behind and it was really, really frustrating. Uh, and we spoke with a woman who's a doctor who lives in Yamhill County. And her telemedicine is so critical to have uh, broadband and it, it only works if people have the connectivity. So in the bipartisan infrastructure law, which I helped pass uh, in the last Congress, uh, which I, again, was very proud to help work on that bipartisan legislation. I've been in Congress a little more than 10 years. We talked about infrastructure a lot. We had infrastructure weeks and infrastructure months and infrastructure work groups. We didn't get it done until the last Congress. There's funding in there for, uh, for, for rural broadband and the undersecretary was here to uh, show her support for implementing those funds and for recognizing how serious it is for our economy, for education, for healthcare. Um, so it was a great meeting and we had those, those voices around the table, including people like Commissioner um, Yamamoto from Tillamook County, uh, people I mentioned in healthcare and education. So I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, we're going to really see these dollars come in and see that connectivity. Um, talking about that, you know, even you know, your district in particular, there's lots of rural areas there Absolutely. You know, that would certainly need access to this. So if this, you know, assuming the funding comes through, is there a plan on how that will be implemented? Is it rolling out more actual lines? Is it using satellites? Is there any kind of specifics as far as that is? Um, I don't have the specifics now, but I know that there are a lot of people in the planning process. Uh, and you know, working with those rural communities is so important. So I don't have Yamhill County in the district anymore, but I, I'm honored to have Tillamook County added. Uh, and so we know how, how large Tillamook County is and how important that connectivity is to places like Tillamook County, Clatsop County, Columbia County, also in the district. But I do wanna note that um, even in Multnomah County, there are places when, um, Portland Public Schools told me at the height of COVID. Some of their students were struggling in, in, even in the Portland Public School District. So I think the pandemic highlighted the need for, uh, for broadband and uh, I'm committed to getting it done. Um, you know, going back there and continuing to talk about you know, your district in Oregon, mm -hmm. you're back here, you know, like I mentioned, talking to right. constituents and everyone. Uh, what is it that you've been hearing from people so far? Well, we had a great meeting yesterday as well about the Chips and Science Act, another big piece of legislation that I was very proud to help pass, uh, and the importance of that funding and what the semiconductor and tech industry means for Oregon. And what I wanna emphasize about that is the workforce piece. 
there's a lot of jobs involved, and this is something that I hear about in many different contexts. For example, it's not just people who are engineers, it's people to build buildings. There is a great program at Portland Community College we visited yesterday, the mechatronics program, uh, that prepares people to work in the semiconductor industry. Uh, they don't need PhDs, and some, some of them don't even need uh, bachelor's degrees to get good jobs and what that means for the economy, but it also comes up in healthcare. For example, workforce needs are tremendous. So one of the bipartisan bills that I have is to expand uh, mental health services for educators who are very burnout. We know there's student mental health needs and educator mental health needs. We need the workforce to do that. And so as a member of the Education and Workforce Committee, I'm very committed to uh, finding pathways for people to get into these good jobs, whether it be through career and technical education, registered apprenticeships, workforce programs, affordable higher education college, community college. Um, those are all pieces that are gonna help get people skilled up for a lot of these good jobs that are coming to Oregon and across the country. Are these programs you're working on right now that somebody could take advantage of or are coming soon? Well, there are many. There are many programs that exist right now. Uh, in fact, the first bill signing I went to as a member of Congress was called the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, and those are workforce programs that currently exist. There are programs that exist like Pell Grants, for example, and Work Study for low-income students to make higher education more affordable. Do we need more? Absolutely. That's how I got through college on my own with a combination of grants and loans and work study. Um, but college was less expensive when I went to school. So we're seeing, of course, the, the high student loan debt that people have. We need to break down those barriers and find a path for people. Uh, registered apprenticeships, again, an opportunity for, uh, for people to get um, on the job training. Uh, we're working on expanding those as well. Some of those are, already exist. Uh, here in Oregon, uh, the late labor organizations have had them. Our now new member of Congress, former labor commissioner, Congresswoman Val Hoyle worked on that at the state level, expanding those opportunities for a pathway to a good job. Um, we, some of the pathways exist, we need to make uh, them easier and less expensive and break down the barriers so people can get those good jobs. Well, talking about what's going on here in Oregon and obviously, sure. you know, especially in Portland and really throughout the state, there's a big homeless and houseless Absolutely. crisis that's going on as we're all well aware of. And I'm curious, from a federal standing, how does what's happening in Oregon compare to other states? And is there anything at the federal level that's kind of going on to maybe address some of these issues? Yes, and I uh, thank you for, for uh, uh, mentioning that because that is something that does come up, not just in Portland. In rural areas, the coastal community, uh, the housing is a challenge, and there are too many people without a home right now. Uh, and yes, it does happen in other places across the country. We know other areas are also um, seeing that significant challenge uh, of homelessness, but also very high housing costs, which is part of it. I'm encouraged uh, by recent conversations that we've had. There is a federal role, but it is going to take federal, state, local, public, private, everyone working together to address it. We desperately need more affordable housing, and that's something where the federal government can make a difference. Um, it's a little in the weeds, but there's something called the Low Income uh, Housing Tax Credit that really makes a difference, that incentivizes the development of more affordable housing. And then we need more treatment options. Obviously, not everyone without a home uh, needs treatment, uh, but sometimes people need health care, mental health care, treatment for addiction or substance use disorders, we need to make that more available and more accessible. So we've been, I've already been in many conversations with local leaders uh, and with my colleagues at the federal level about how we can address these needs. Uh, and uh, again, it's not just an urban issue. I hear it on the coast, I hear it in suburban issues as well. We need more affordable housing and we need more resources that, that provide the support services for people to transition them from the street into housing and into a, a good job. Speaking to your colleagues, you know, in, in the house there, mm -hmm. are you seeing, are they talking about this in their states as well? Of course, yes. So it's, so it's not just Oregon. It's not just Oregon. Northwest. Right. Um, something else I wanted to address, which obviously is very big news right now, former President Trump uh, being indicted. I just wondered if you had any thoughts or opinions on that and what's proceeding there with the process. Sure, my thought is that when someone violates the law, 
they should be held accountable. It doesn't matter who they are. Our system of justice is designed that way. And uh, it's my understanding from what I've seen uh, that there was enough evidence for a grand jury in New York to indict the former president on I believe it's 34 counts. Um, and that's how the justice system works. So now the president of course is presumed innocent and there will be a trial. So that is the justice system that we have. Uh, I think it would send a terrible message if someone violated the law and was not held accountable because of the power that that person had. That's not a fair and equitable justice system. So we'll let the, the court in New York, not the court of public opinion, decide what will happen to the former president. Well, Representative, you know, the, the last thing I just kind of want to bring up here is, you know, as we're proceeding through this year, not quite to the halfway point, is there any one particular thing that you really want to accomplish as we, as we go through the year? Oh, that, that's, a big, big <laughs> that's a big question. That's a big question. That's hard. I don't know if I can pick just one. I do want to note um, that I have been, because this is an important issue, I've been working to address the climate crisis and climate change since uh, my time in Congress uh, and even in the state legislature to some extent, but it really is a serious issue and we're seeing the effects here in Oregon and across the country and around the globe. The increase in severe weather events, in intensity, in frequency, we see, you know, we had that heat dome people lost their lives. We see raging wildfires and in, in some places drought. Um, I work on a lot of ocean issues, ocean acidification affecting the health of our ocean. These things are affecting health, uh, they're affecting our economy, and they're affecting our future. So I was really honored to serve on the Select Committee on the Climate Crisis, and we wrote a science-based comprehensive climate action plan Many of the pieces have been already passed into law or put into rule, uh, and we're gonna keep working on those. And I'm happy to say that on the science committee, we just moved forward several bills, include, and all bipartisan, including bills to deal with ocean acidification and more research on these issues. So this is a serious, serious issue that affects everyone, and we need to take bold action. So um, it, it is a, a sort of overarching issue that affects everyone, so I would like to continue to make progress on climate change, and I mentioned some of these efforts have been bipartisan. I'm the co-chair of the Bipartisan Oceans Caucus. Um, we're working on keeping the ocean healthy, because if the ocean's not healthy, the planet's not healthy. So um, there, are, there are many issues, um, education, climate, housing. I, I care about all of them, so I'm not gonna pick just one. Fair enough. Well, Congresswoman, thank you so much uh, for spending some time with us here to talk about all of this, and appreciate you and what you're doing, and for everybody watching. My pleasure. Uh, I'm Greg Nibbler with Fox 12 Oregon.